Pete and Repeat, my two dear friends, were sitting in a boat. Pete fell out. Who was left? Pete and Repeat, my two dear friends, were sitting in a boat. Pete fell out. Who was left? Repeat and Pete were sitting in a boat. Repeat fell out. Who was left? Oops, I made a mistake. What does this annoying joke have to do with programming? Well, keep watching and I'll tell you. Hey folks, my name is Pat Schloss and this is Code Club. What I just illustrated by that annoying joke that uh, is just so annoying is the value of dry. Dry is a principle within programming practice, which is an acronym for don't repeat yourself. Because as I illustrated by repeating that joke, that when you repeat yourself, you are prone to insert problems that, in my case, kill the joke, although the joke was pretty much dead already. Anyway, in programming, we want to minimize the amount of repetition in our code, and so we want to keep our code dry. If you've been following along in recent episodes of Code Club, you know that I've been kind of working through uh, illustrating to you how we might use a new R package developed by my research group called Microbe ML to identify biomarkers within a person's fecal microbiota that we can use to distinguish them from having uh, normal colons as well as people with uh, severe polyps or screen-relevant neoplasias within their colons. And so as we've been going through, I've been illustrating things using a L2 regularized logistic regression model. So we've started with this run genus split dot R script. Um, this script runs for each seed of a random number generator. We call this 100 times. That allows us to do 100 80-20 splits where 80% of the data is used for training and validation. And then the held out 20% is used to take that model and then evaluate it to test it using that held out data. So we do that 100 times, so we get a pretty good robust feel for how the model is performing and to make sure it's not overfit. So we built this using genus level relative abundance data. That's coming here uh, in the select statement with the taxonomy and relabund columns. Uh, we go through and we build out the rest of the model. Um, and then we also write the data out to a RDS file, which is a a binary file created by R. In a more recent episode, we went back and we basically made the same exact script, only we added the column fit result. Fit result is a measure of the amount of blood in a person's stool sample. So as you can see, these two scripts are basically identical. How identical? Well, it's kind of hard to see from looking at this vantage point. So we'll use a couple handy functions from the command line that comes to us from a Linux type of environment. So I want to look in the code directory at my two R scripts that end in split.r. And so again, we've got genus fit, split.r, and then run genus split.r. And I can use a handy dandy function called diff um, to do code forward slash split.r. And what this output shows is a little bit confusing, um, but what you'll see is that the code is outputted in chunks separated by three hyphens, right? And so we have uh, these first two lines that correspond to run genus fit split.r, and then these two lines below the hyphens that correspond to code run genus split. And so this is telling us that these two lines are different between the two files. And as you can see in this first line, the only thing that's different is the variable name. And the second line, the only thing that's different is the fit result. Similarly, if you come down further into the file, uh, diff tells us that there's this line that's different. And again, that's the difference in the variable name. And then down here, again, the only thing that's different is the variable name. So we have two scripts <laughs> and there's really only one meaningful word that's different between the two R scripts, right? So as we think about perhaps adding more features that we want to add to our model or perhaps using a different modeling approach, we're gonna keep, it seems, keep propagating different R scripts to carry out the analysis we want. That is not dry. So again, dry stands for don't repeat yourself. And as I've illustrated, I'm clearly repeating myself where again, if I look back at my individual R scripts, I've got about 32 lines of code in each of these R scripts, and there's only one different line among those 32 lines between the two R scripts. Again, that is not dry. And the reason that that's a problem is because I keep copying and propagating this script, 
I'm very likely to introduce bugs as I go through. If you've watched any of my past episodes, you know that I am very prone to introducing typos and doing silly things. And so as much as possible, I would like to have a single script that I can perhaps feed in arguments where the argument is the thing that is changing um, across the different executions, right? So maybe I'll have an argument for running it using just the genus level data with the relative abundance. Perhaps I'll have another argument for feeding in uh, that same data, but also the fit result. Or perhaps uh, we'll also do it using a random forest. But to do random forest, we'll also have to perhaps give it different hyperparameters. So as you go through, uh, you begin to see where all this replication and duplication could cause problems, because perhaps I want to use a set of hyperparameters for all my logistic regression models, but I'm copying and pasting between different files, and lo and behold, I've changed the parameters between my different models, my different runnings of this script, right? So say I have five different versions of this script for building a logistic regression model, but I accidentally introduced changes into the hyperparameters. That could cause a big problem, right? So if I had a single script to run the logistic regression, but I only feed it the things that are gonna change, I will then have dry code. We often see this in a single script, and I have heard this called spaghetti code, where somebody might have a few hundred lines of code and they're repeating the same chunk of code multiple times. I've seen this in my own lab where somebody was reading data coming out of um, a kind of a 96 well plate reader. And so for each plate, they had the same chunk replicated several times. So if there were five plates, they had that chunk repeated five times. And each time they had a subtle tweak to how that plate was being read because the plates weren't all the same layout, right? And so instead of creating a single function that was called five times, they were repeating that code five times. And so again, if they introduced a bug uh, into one of those chunks, then they would need to update that chunk as well as everything else. And it just got really messy. So again, we want to dry out our code as much as possible. But as I mentioned, we can use things like arguments, we can use functions, we can use script files, to help dry out our code. As we've already seen in this R script that I've been talking about, we source code genus process.r. That is a R script that does a bunch of pre-processing of our data to bring together our relative abundance data and our metadata so we don't have to replicate that in all of our different R scripts. So we've got some elements of dry coding already, um, but the point of today's episode is to see if we can't go further in drying out our code so that we can then replicate what we're currently doing with those logistic regression models to do it also with random forest. As I've already shown you with the output of the diff function here in my RStudio terminal window, there's not much different between these two scripts. What I'd like to do is go ahead and consolidate these two R scripts into a single run split dot R script that can be fed information about what is going on in the select line so that I only have one piece of code, one, one R script. So let's go ahead back to our source window and see how we might go about doing that. So to start, I'm going to go ahead and rename my run genus split. So I can check the box next to run genus split and do rename, and I will go ahead and do run split.r. And so now I've got run split.r. So my plan here is to have a separate R script for each different type of model that I'm going to build. That then will become an argument that I get through this command args function. So currently we're getting the output file name, which is where we then also get the seed as well as the name of the output file, right? So we're gonna have another argument that we will, will bring in, um, and that will be uh, the type of model, right? And that is going to be the name of the R script that is going to bring in all this extra goodness to keep this run split.r script as dry as possible. That R script is going to contain some version of the select line because that's the only thing at this point that's varying between our different R scripts, right? So I'll have a variable called feature script, which for now I'll call put in the code and will be l2 genus.r. So I haven't created that yet, remember? And then we'll do source on feature script. And so that way then whatever this value is that comes to us from command args will then be fed into source and then we'll replace this line 14. So I will go ahead and copy that. So I'll create a new R script and plop that select function in here. And so I'm gonna create a new function that I'll call feature select. 
and this will be function, and the argument coming into it will be x, and that x is basically the composite data frame or whatever's upstream of this select function call. And so then that will run select, but we need to pipe x into this select function, right? And so I'll get rid of that final pipe. And again, each different type of model that we create will uh, run its own version of feature select. So again, I will save this into code as l2genus.r. Instead of this select line, what we'll now do is feature select, okay? And so let's run everything upstream and, and hope for the best. So I'll go ahead and source these lines. I'm gonna go ahead and put in an output file name for testing purposes. So I'll do output file uh, is processed data forward slash l2 uh, genus one dot rds. And so then again, the seed extracts the seed from that name, so one. And then we have feature script and we'll source that. And now we run this and it goes through without an error. And we can then look at SRN genus data and we get Again, all of the bacterial taxonomic names, and we're in good shape. So now we're set up to be dry, right? And so again, I have SRN genus data. Um, I can remove the genus uh, probably from everywhere in my script here. Uh, let me see where I have genus and remove genus preprocess, genus data, and all these things we're doing uh, to make our code more dry. So we've moved genus from all of the variable names. That was the other thing that when we did the diff was different between our different scripts. So now we have run split.r works. Now what we need to do is get feature script from the command line. To do that, I'm gonna go back to my make file. We will now look at this chunk of code up here from our make file for where we were doing this. Now I'll put in here code forward slash l2 genus.r. And so that is a dependency of the rule. And we're putting in this dollar sign at, which is the target names. Um, and so we can also then feed into this code forward slash L2 genus dot R as a input to uh, run, not run genus split, but run split dot R. Uh, and so also we'll remove runs genus split here. And so now if we go back to run split dot R, we now want to get feature script from our, our, our inputs, right? And so I'm going to save output file uh, to be args1, and my feature script will be args2, and then this will be args. And so we should be good to go now to go ahead and make uh, that target that I had uh, put in here to kind of test things. So if I come back to my terminal, I can do make process data l2 genus one dot rds. Wonderful, so that ran through without any errors or any problems. Now what I wanna do is go ahead and create an l2 genus fit dot r script, right? And so that will hopefully replace this run genus fit split file. And again, we can take very much the same idea that we had here, but add fit result so we can then replace that line that we had in run genus fit split, right, this, so we can now use run split r as a single r script to run all the modeling for both types of models, right? Again, to repeat, we'll grab another r script. I'll save this as l2 genus fit dot r, and I will go ahead and grab this code and plop it into here. But as we saw, we want this select line. And we'll get rid of that final pipe, save it. So now we've got l2 genus fit dot r. We no longer need this run genus fit split r. So again, I'll come back to my code and we'll get rid of that run uh, genus fit split and we'll delete. So that's good. Now we need to update our make file as we saw earlier. We're gonna go ahead back in here and we'll remove the genus fit, genus process. We need to add code forward slash L2 genus fit dot R. And then we'll do run split dot R and we will add the specific R script for this modeling approach as uh, to the recipe for building out uh, the target, right? So let's go ahead and save that. And now uh, let's test that by coming back 
And instead of doing genus underscore one, we'll do underscore, we'll do underscore fit underscore one. We'll run that and everything should be good. That ran without any issues, so we're in good shape to go forward. It might seem like we haven't gained a whole lot uh, because we've actually gained a file <laughs> to have to keep track of. But we've encapsulated the part that's varying from run to run or from uh, model to model in its own separate R script, focusing on the thing that varies between the different executions or the different types of models that we're creating. And then this run split.r doesn't have to change because it's loading the information that's changing from these other R scripts. And so this script remains dry. And again, we're kind of encapsulating away the parts that are changing. Now that we have the code working with our L2 regularized logistic regression using genus level relative abundances and the fit result, I now want to go ahead and see if we can't get it to work also with random forest. This is going to introduce a few more complications because not only do we need to use that feature selection uh, function, but we will also need to tell um, run split.r what modeling approach we want and what hyperparameters do we want? Because the hyperparameters for the L2 logistic regression are different than those for random forest. Let's go ahead and start simple by copying what we've done already with L2 for random forest. I'll go ahead and create an R script that I will save into code and I will call this RF genus.r. We're gonna grab this feature select because that is the same between L2 and random forest. So again, when we then run this for the random forest, we're gonna get this feature selection. Now what we wanna think about are the hyperparameter. Again, what we have down here in our code is test HP. I don't know why we had called it test HP. I think I'll call this hyperparameter. And of course we need that hyperparameter down here. Hyperparameters equals hyperparameter. Uh, let's just make our indenting look nice. And these hyperparameters are what was used for the L2. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this out and put this up here as a variable in my L2 genus.r and in my L2 genus fit.r. And of course I now need a hyperparameter variable for my RF genus.r, but these aren't the hyperparameters I want. The hyperparameter I want is mtry. If you're not sure what hyperparameters are available for the modeling approach you want, you can do get hyperparameters list and you can give it the name of your data frame. So mine called SRN data, and I'll, then I'll put in RF, I guess I hadn't loaded that. I have eight, 17, and 34. Uh, this is based on the total number of features in the data frame. So for demonstration purposes of getting things dry, I'll use these three M try values, but know that when you're doing this for real with your own research, you might want to futz with those M try values, kind of like we did in a previous episode for logistic regression. You basically want your test AUC to be the highest. And so you pick the M try value that gives you the highest uh, test AUC. I'm going to go ahead and grab that 81734 and I will say M try equals those. And maybe I'll also go ahead and put in here 100. So these need to be separated by commas. So again, when this R script is loaded by source, the hyperparameter comes in. The other thing that we'd like to say is what is the modeling approach? I'll say approach equals RF. That is the modeling name for random forest. And then down here where I have method, uh, I can say approach, All right? And so then that GLM net will be the approach for my genus and genus fit. GLM net, and we'll go ahead and copy that over for our L2. So again, now we have our approach, our hyperparameters, um, our feature selection encapsulated out of this file. Again, we now need to update our make file to build out our RF genus RDS files. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this uh, L2 genus RDS down here and I'll replace the L2 with RF, RF, RF. I think the first thing I'll do is rerun uh, the previous logistic regression models I made. 
Um, and then I'll try it with this random forest uh, set of scripts. So that ran well. I'm now gonna change that L2 to RF. And I don't know how long this will take. It might take a while, but we'll let that run and hopefully everything goes smoothly. So that took a long time to run, but I'm happy to see it made it through without any problems. I will probably save running the rest of the 100 splits until I can you know, move everything up to my high performance computer and let it run there. Again, that's one of the advantages of working with an HPC is that I can run it up there, forget about it as a job, and then be notified when the job is completed. And I can use my computer down here for doing better things like say, I don't know, editing this video or responding to your all's very kind comments uh, down below. As you become more proficient in identifying those duplicated blocks of code, uh, you will also become more proficient in preventing those duplicated blocks of code. But please don't stress out about duplicated blocks of code if this is the first time you've thought about, you know, should I be duplicating my code? Should I be repeating myself? No, you shouldn't be. But the most important thing is to get your code to work. And if that means you have the same code chunk five times, cool, that is a place to start from, right? That works, it gives you the right answer. But look ahead and realize that that's gonna be really hard to maintain or add to as your analysis uh, gets more mature. So identify that you've got those five blocks of code. As you go through, again, you will find strategies to prevent those duplicated blocks of code. In my own code here, um, I've baked in dry principles without even thinking much about it, right? And so, for example, um, I run this script 100 times for 100 different seeds. I obviously don't have the same script copied 100 times with a different seed, right? So feeding in an argument from the command line is one strategy to keeping the code dry. Another place that you can help keep your code dry is through the use of variables, right? So if you can you know, attach a data frame to a variable name, well, then you don't have to repeat this whole pipeline of composite down through select every time you wanna do something on that data, right? I have that now saved as SRN data, and then I can use SRN data as input to the different steps of my pipeline. So that also helps keep code dry. Something else to think about is how you're creating file names. So for example, I could have used the glue function to create the name of my output file, right? Um, and so that would be something like processed file forward slash um, L2 genus underscore one through 100 dot RDS, right? And so I could have hard coded that kind of down here at the end, but what I decided to do instead is to put that all back up in my make file so I don't have to worry about the path or that special file name that tells me from looking at the file name what type of model was created, right? And so I keep that kind of creation of the file name back in the make file. And so now I've got the file name as a variable that I can also extract the seed from because I know that all of my output files will have the same format, right? So again, that is another way of keeping your code dry. A final way that we talked about today is taking that part that varies between different copies of the script and pulling that out to its own R script. That way I can look at each of the three R scripts that I have so far to modify the set variables that I need to modify to run those types of modeling framework. Again, with these individual R scripts for the different modeling frameworks I'm using, it gets very easy to add uh, different features that I want, to change hyperparameters, to change the approach, without having to come back in and change runsplit.r. If you are working within a makefile environment, one of the other great things about having these separate um, scripts with the parameters for each different modeling framework is that that file, runsplit.r, is a dependency of everything, right? So if I'm going in and I update runsplit.r for logistic regression and I've already run random forest, well, I'm gonna have to rerun everything for random forest, right? But if runsplit.r doesn't change in all of these different modeling frameworks, and I have to go in and say, change the hyperparameters of l2genus.r, that's not gonna trigger make to rebuild the random forest. That's only going to affect where l2genus.r is called in the make file. Again, keeping things dry also makes things more efficient in how they're run. 
Something that I will leave for you as a challenge from today's episode is go ahead and see if you can create rfgenusfit.r. Think about what would you need to do? What would the R script look like to build a random forest model using genus and fit? Okay, see if you can do it. Um, let me know if you run into any problems down in the comments. The second thing that I will tell you to do as an assignment is look at your latest chunk of code. Do you see elements in there that you are repeating? What strategies could you use in your R code to limit the repetition of the code across your R script? Again, when I'm working with people that are just getting their feet wet in programming with R, I find that they might have an R script that has a few hundred lines of code and there's the same block or the same variable getting repeated many times. Do you see evidence of that? Then go in and see if you can use some of the strategies I've discussed today to go ahead and dry it out. So keep practicing with this. Again, don't expect you to get things perfect the first time. I certainly don't get things perfect the first time as I've shown you here many, many times. But we want to identify problems and then work to solve them. And along the way, learn to do things better. Till next time, keep practicing and we'll see you for another episode of Code Club.